tuning in to Remnant Radio. My name is Michael Roundtree. I have here on my left, your right, Ken Fish. We also have Josh Lewis on vacation, but not really on vacation because he's going to be tuning in uh, by Skype. And so you'll uh, you'll see him in just a moment. But before we do uh, jump any further into this subject of the courts of heaven, it's going to be an exciting episode. Uh, we, we just want to uh, just let me tell you a little bit about what Remnant Radio is and what we do. Uh, we are a theology broadcast. We interview pastors, teachers and scholars from all over the world from a diversity of perspectives within the spectrum of orthodoxy. And our hope is to help you break out of your theological echo chamber and challenge your presuppositions. And so it really helps stretch your mind and your faith so that you can better understand God and His Word. That is what we're all about here. And so uh, if you've benefited from uh, Remnant Radio, we have a lot of a lot of people just w- even watching right now, and you guys are our regulars. And just uh, But... Uh, Tune in, uh, subscribe, like, comment, share. Uh, we want to get this message out there. So, uh, Ken, tell us a little bit about yourself. I'm Ken Fish. I'm the founder of Orbis Ministries, uh, formerly known as Kingdom Fire Ministries. Uh, I travel itinerantly, but I also lead seminars and speak in conferences. I work with church leaders, uh, sometimes with government and business leaders, and uh, I've been... I don't know, serving the Lord in one way or another for over 40 years. Okay. All right. And now, uh, Josh, why don't you give us a little bit of a a glimpse of just kind of what's coming down the pike uh, this week as well as this episode, what we should expect? Yeah. um, Guys, so much fun to be with you guys across the the internet here on Skype. I really enjoy uh, being able to continue the ministry even though we are in a different space. Uh, we have some really exciting episodes today. We are talking about uh, The Courts of Heaven. Uh, it's a book uh, written by Robert Henderson. Uh, the crew and I have read this book. We were really interested in doing a response to it, as you guys have asked us to. So today, we're going to be talking about like five secrets, secret knowledge that we see uh, in this book. Next uh, Wednesday, we're going to be talking about the exegesis of this book, how uh, the author found these secrets in Scripture. We're actually going to point out how the Scriptures don't actually say uh, what he says they say, uh, which is going to blossom uh, into what we're talking about tonight. So we're kind of going to do it interesting. We're going to say, hey, the teachings here are pretty Gnostic. There's a lot of secret teaching here. Secondly, we're going to show you how the author came to those conclusions. Uh, And then thirdly, we might come out with another episode later, um, kind of dialoguing about what accurate accurate prayer, what real prayer actually is. Uh, but, but look forward to that to hear in the future. Uh, the five things we're talking about today, the secret judgment that we see in this book, secret deliverance, secret prayer practices, the pre-incarnation of the soul, and the prioritization of heaven over uh, what is here naturally here on the earth. So that's what you kind of have to look forward to. That's a lot of what the book is talking about. Uh, so we're going to be, we're going to dialogue about that before we even get an introduction. What is the courts of heaven? For those who are tuning in, uh, I'd like to ask, what is our posture, guys? Because this is a Christian brother that we're that, that wrote this book. We're going to be dialoguing about uh, his teaching here. We want to make sure that we both have humble hearts. We're not a discernment ministry. We're not heretic hunters. We're not out there trying to correct everybody's doctrine. Uh, our show, if anything, we're here inviting pastors and teachers for, within Orthodoxy to come on the show. But this book, um, though, though I'm, I'm, I'm being generous, uh, making sure that it's saying, hey, this guy's a brother— uh, but this book in particular uh, has got some very, very dangerous teachings uh, that we are very concerned about. Uh, so, so in saying all of that, I want to toss it over to Michael and Ken. You guys help us help us understand what's the tone of today's episode. So those who are listening are like, wait, why is Remnant Radio doing an episode like this? Why is this important? Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's an important question to me because we're really... Uh, we are not heretic hunters. We're not out to just like tell everybody else that they're bad. That's really not our goal. Uh, but there comes a time, you, you know, when you put something in writing, it's in book form. This isn't just like a statement that maybe you let slip that could be misinterpreted. Like, I mean, we can follow your line of argument and we're seeing destructive tendencies of it. We, we do want to speak into that. At the same time, we, we want to be as charitable as possible. We want to give people the benefit of the doubt. And, and you know, uh, Ken, I know you do, and I do too. We have, we have people we love and care about that, uh, that ascribe to the courts of heaven approach to prayer. And 
Uh, and honestly, I'd been hearing about it for years. And as a pastor, I kind of feel like, man, I should have read this book much earlier. I just read it last week because I, you know, I've been hearing about it all these years. I was always a little bit uncomfortable with it uh, and just the way people described it. But it was so convoluted. I couldn't quite tell what they were describing. Right. But, um, you know, our goal is not to out people as heretics and tell them they're terrible. Uh, but at the same time, we are seeking truth. Right. And so uh, we want to have a tone that, that kind of balances that. How, how would you describe it? Um, well, you know, this idea of the courts of heaven, first of all, we need to define our language. Uh, one of the things that I find really problematic with a lot of uh, modern charismatic teaching, and maybe we could even broaden it and say just modern theological teaching, wherever it's being uh, promulgated. It may not be from a charismatic pulpit. Sometimes it's from an evangelical pulpit. Sometimes it's from a you know, liberal Christian pulpit. But we don't always define our terms, and as a result, we're sloppy. And when we use the word court, uh, court actually has several meanings. Now, I've looked this up in the dictionary. You can do the same thing. Um, I carry a Merriam-Webster's online on my phone. Um, the information I've distilled, and I'm going to give you in just a moment, I, excuse me, I took from the Merriam-Webster entry on the word court, and there's at least three meanings for the word court. The first meaning is um, an enclosed space, often adjacent to a, perhaps a large, uh, spacious home. Merriam-Webster says a manor style home, like you might think of an English garden home or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and we can, of course, go immediately to a tennis court. So that would be one use of the word court, and it, it's often used for a playing field. We have a basketball court. So that sense of the court, um, jokingly, we see this in Scripture because Moses served in Pharaoh's court. So Ooh, the first good. reference of tennis in the Bible. Oh, man, you right. aced that one. Yeah, yuck, yuck, yuck. Okay. See what I did? Wah, wah, wah. <laughs> All right, so that's, that's the first <laughs> use of the word court. That's not what we're talking about. But I'm laying it out there because I think we want to define our terms. Uh, the second use of the word court would be uh, something that is um, the heavenly court. And when we say the heavenly court, we actually have several places in Scripture where the court of heaven is described. But before I go any further, I want to I stop. And when I say the court of heaven, I don't mean something judicial. I don't mean a place in which uh, legal proceedings are adjudicated. When I say the court of heaven in this second sense, I refer to the place where a sovereign or a king or queen sits enthroned, and those who are the advisors and the uh, mediators and so forth gather around that sovereign, and they, they give their input. And, and again, we have several places where this is shown. Uh, there are two snapshots of this in the book of Job, one of them is in Job 1, and uh, it'd be verses 1 to 12. And then the second one is in Job 2, verses 1 to 7. They're essentially the same scenario where God is seated on his throne. He's the king. He's the sovereign. And it says all the sons of God were gathered to him. So these are all of the hosts of heaven, we might say. And so they're gathered together, and it says, and Satan came also among them. But this is most particularly not a courtroom. This is a throne room that is where the heavenly court is meeting. Now, I'm emphasizing the words as I go because I'm really trying to lay out that although this is called a court, it is not a courtroom in the legal sense. It is a throne room in which the court of heaven, meaning all of the courtiers, are gathered around the throne. Like a royal so, court. Like a royal court. And so, for example, if you were to go today to England and you were to go to Buckingham Palace and be admitted, uh, is somewhere inside there you would find the Queen of England, Queen Elizabeth, today. She'd be seated on the throne. This would be the Court of St. James is what we call it. That's legally what it is known as, the Court uh -huh. of St. James. But the Queen of England doesn't adjudicate cases. She simply rules from the Court of St. James. Uh-huh. We see another snapshot of the same idea in 1 Kings 22, 19. This is the uh, story of the prophet Micaiah, and he uh, yeah. comes in before the battle of Ramoth Gilead. And uh, Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, has asked Ahab, everybody go, 
Ahab, boo hiss, bad guy yeah. Israel, right? Uh, Jehoshaphat has asked Ahab before the battle of Ramoth Gilead, is there no authentic prophet of the Lord? of whom we can inquire. And Ahab says, well, there is one. His name's Micaiah, but I hate him. He never says anything good about me. And Jehoshaphat says, bring him in. And so uh, Micaiah comes in, and Ahab says, well, shall we go to battle or not? And sarcastically, Micaiah answers Ahab and says, oh, yes, go forth and conquer. And Ahab says, how many times do I have to tell you to tell me only the truth? that the Lord chose you. And he says, all right, here's what I saw. I saw the Lord seated on his throne and all the host of heaven before him. That exact verse is two, uh, 1 Kings 22, 19. And he says, and a lying spirit came forth and said, I will be a deceiving spirit, a spirit of false prophecy uh -huh. in the mouths of all the prophets. Mm -hmm. And so all that these other prophets are saying is false. The king will die today. I'm, I'm abbreviating, but that's what happens. And so this creates a stir in the in the th in the uh, throne room where Ahab amongst and Jehoshaphat amongst the heavenly are. court. Yeah. Well, this isn't the heavenly court now. Now we're back on earth, right? So okay. all the people on earth are angry because Micaiah well, yes. is saying this okay. of what he'd seen in the heavenly court. I see. Yeah, yes, I yeah. agree. And so, anyway, um, so the story ends, but in the end, Ahab does die, and the word of Micaiah comes to pass. Right. But note that what he had seen in the heaven was not a court room in a judicial sense where you would get, say, a restraining order, right. or where you would get a divorce decree, or where you would, you know, go and have a some sort of a claim against somebody that you think right. has ripped you off, and like so the, you sue them. The citizens of England aren't going to Buckingham Palace to get their cases decided. That's right. Right. So Different in this, kind of court. In this second case, when we say the court, we mean a royal court in which the sovereign sits enthroned, and we do see that in the Bible. Right. The third That's case right. is the one that the book is talking about, and it suggests that there is a courtroom, like if you needed to deal with a traffic ticket uh -huh. or a divorce or a lawsuit or something like that, you would go into the court and you get some sort of a writ or a judgment from the judge. Uh huh. There is no place in Scripture where that idea is put forth. Right. Okay. Now, uh, and Josh, I want to pull you into this conversation. So, uh, Josh, help us understand. I I know that you've read this book in detail, and so Ken just gave us those different definitions, and particularly the last two between the the throne room perspective of the heavenly court, and and then this idea of a legal court system. How does that play into Robert Henderson's explanation of the courts of heaven and how they function for our prayer life? Yeah, so the, the the book really is going to double down on this kind of idea that the courts of heaven is going to be judicial. Uh, I would actually argue from reading uh, Robert Henderson's book um, on the courts of heaven that this is almost 100%. He conflates all of the courts together. He, actually, anytime he sees any kind of judgment being given, he equates it to the throne of heaven, uh, or to, to the courts of heaven. So he even makes the case that if you want to pray for your family or, or, or yourself or something going on that's in your own life, there are different courts that you actually have to go to. The throne of grace is one court where, where, where God reigns supreme, and then there's a group of individuals who are sitting in that courtroom chamber with him. And as you go before the throne of grace to, to plead your case, that, that, that group is there. He would also, I mean, by deduction, make the case that the accuser of the brethren is in the throne of grace trying to resist you. Um, so uh, it's, it's a very, very um, uh, difficult thing. I would encourage everyone, I'm kind of throwing a, a fastball at crew. I don't know if he's got that graphic ready, but Dawson has put together a very thorough and in-depth study, study guide uh, in the uh, description of this video. And soon we'll actually get a book review out on this. So I would really encourage you guys, after this video, um, the, first, the first couple pages, I want to say it's the first six pages, I wrote it down in my notes, but the first six pages is basically outlining Robert Henderson's uh, position in the book. Uh, and then, then pages seven through, I want to say it's like 11, uh, is, is actually Dawson writing a court case. It's, it's as if he's writing his own court case, and uh, uh, he is, he's putting the courts of heaven to the courts of heaven. It's actually pretty, pretty clever how he wrote it. Uh, and then in the end section, just how, how prayer has been used historically. And then another resource for you guys, if you're out there, we, we love Michael Heiser. Uh, we think he's a great resource. We would encourage you guys to pick up um, The Unseen Realm. That, that's going to give you, I think, a, 
a biblical view of what's going on in the heavens and how those things work out. So we're not actually denying that there are um, a divine council, right? Uh, uh, I don't, I can't speak for Ken, uh, but I'm pretty sure Michael and I would hold to a view. I, I'm, I'm saying pretty sure for Michael because we hang out more. Uh, and I, I don't know. I'll let Michael kind of give his own position here, but uh, I do think that there is a divine council uh, where where God is working, like where He says, "Who will go for us?" You know, um, you know, and this lying spirit comes forward and says, "I'll go." Uh, so there, there seems to be a cooperation with this divine council uh, in heaven. And, and, and uh, Michael Heiser does a good job in his. Deuteronomy 32 worldview explaining that. So those are all resources yeah. that you can pick up and, and dig into. But to Michael's question, you know, uh, uh, how do we understand this? Uh, it's difficult, right? Um, because this book lays upon the premise that no one has done this before. It even makes the case that 9-11 happened uh, because the church in America had lost their lampstand, right? We had, we'd lost our position and our authority in the courts of heaven. Uh, we, we didn't have anyone there. And, and he has this new revelation that gives him authority and breakthrough in prayer. And, and this is this is something that's very interesting, guys. And I need you to kind of um, he, hear the levity of this, right? The, the, not the levity, the weight of this. Um, when we go and pray to God, he won't be able to answer our prayers. The way that this is postured, the way this is talk, talked about is, is if we don't file the right paperwork, like when we go to our regular courts here on earth, uh, if we don't, if we don't uh, correctly pray the prayer in a specific way, uh, God will resist our prayers from heaven and not answer those prayers because uh, the, the 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 enemy, the accuser of the brethren, is trying to resist our prayers, and God can't give us legal right to what we're asking for until we go through this courtroom in a specific process, silence the enemy, give God permission. So in this illustration, Satan has all the power. Uh, and, and only man, when he gives God the power, can he, in fact, overthrow throw the rule of Satan. Uh, right. And if you can't tell, that creates yeah. some serious, serious... Yeah, and, that's, and just to be clear, that's not a minor point of his, of his book. It's actually the point of his book. The He's, entire point. He, he says that, like, this is the core of what this book is about. We have to give God a legal right to fulfill his passion. So God is just kind of up in heaven, handcuffed, and we are the we're the liberators who are to liberate him, so that he has a legal right. It all comes back to this legal right. The legal right issue goes back, especially to Daniel chapter ten, where you have you know Gabriel wants to come and answer Daniel's prayer, but he can't because he's caught up in some spiritual warfare with a principality over Persia and a principality over Greece, these demonic powers over different nations. And so Michael comes into the rescue. And so he points to that story and he says, look, there was a problem here. Daniel wasn't getting his prayer answered because there was an issue in the courts of heaven. And if you practice my secret prayer practices, and Josh, I think this was one of your five points. You said that we were going to try to hit on the secret prayer practices. Mm -hmm. If you yeah. understand this secret prayer practice, then you can get your prayers answered. And then he goes through and he says, because I got this prayer answered, and I got that prayer answered, and we prayed for Germany. And, and it's this sort of visionary process where, you know, he tells a story like, we, you know, I had this vision in the court of the courts of heaven, and I, and I saw a book, and it was, you know, the spine of the book looked like this, and the writing looked like that. And, and you know, I, I read the book, and so I was able to apply the decree in heaven upon the earth. And so he, he requires us, instead of going to the Father and ans asking for just, you know, asking for things, whatever it is we're praying for, it's, it's this visionary process that we have to enter into these courts of heaven. And it's, so secret prayer practices. And so, Ken, now I'm going to bring this back to you. Uh, contrast what we're describing with the biblical model of prayer. Yeah, and before I do that, let me just say this. Um, there is some discussion um, among folks who are following this teaching as to who actually came up with it first. We've been talking about Robert Henderson, and he has a number of books out on this general subject of the courts of heaven. But there's also a teacher out of New Zealand by the name of Ian Clayton, and he too teaches on this. And then there's another individual here in the United States named... Um, 
hope I got his name right, Francis Miles. If I've got it wrong, whoever the real Francis Miles is, please forgive me, but I'm pretty sure that's the guy's name. <laughs> uh, and, and he talks about heavenly restraining orders. So we go to the court and we get restraining orders to stop Satan from doing what he does. So we have at least the two original ones, Ian Clayton and Robert Henderson, and now we have this third individual who's talking about restraining orders. Um, you know, all of this kind of teaching is actually vaguely reminiscent, or more than vaguely, of some of the things that many centuries ago Paul the Apostle was speaking of in the book of Colossians, and later the uh, earliest leaders of the church in the second century and the third century came against under the name of Gnosticism, or specialized knowledge. Gnosis is the word for knowledge. And so I'm trying hard not to call all of this Gnostic, but I will say there are aspects of it that are reminiscent. And depending on whose version of this you're listening to, uh, you may even read in their writings or watch on their videos where they talk about the need for us to ascend into heaven. Well, this idea of ascension into the heavens is one of the core teachings of Gnosticism. Mm. So there's a lot of things here that it's almost like something that had been addressed literally centuries ago and put to rest, has now returned. So with that, um, let's talk a little bit about a biblical model of prayer. And so with that, um, let's look at the Gospel of Luke chapter 1, excuse me, 11, chapter 11, Luke chapter 11, verse 1. And it says this, Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. So they want to know how to pray what Jesus prayed, and they see something different about Jesus. They know that he's having a kind of success and fruitfulness in the ministry that he's doing that they aren't enjoying. And so they say, you know, tell us what the secret sauce is, Jesus. And so Jesus says to them, when you pray, say, your honor, let the court come to order. (laughs) Oh, wait, that's not what it said. I'm sorry. It said, Father... Hallowed be your name. Well, he doesn't address the Father as judge. He doesn't address him as your honor. He addresses him as Father. And he says, when you pray, you should do the same thing that I do. So call him Father. And he says, may your name be held in reverence. And this word hallowed means to make holy and to set apart, but it also carries with it a sense of... um, specialness. In German, there's a term Gemütlichkeit. It's, it has a sense of Gemütlichkeit wow, to it. Wow, that kind was of, good, man. Thank you. Are you German? Vielen Dank. <laughs> uh, but, it, but it has a sense of a kind of coziness and uh, togetherness and familiarity and intimacy. It has no sense of a judicial proceeding with its stiffness and, um, what do we want to say, uh, formulas and kind of rigid protocol yes yeah so which he says if you if you get the protocol wrong you might not get your answer that's right oh whoa, whoa. Jesus... he goes beyond that he says if you don't get the protocol right you might actually have demonic attack against you and it's very dangerous to go into the courts of heaven and get it wrong because not only will god not answer your prayer you might have demonic attack after your life so so if you go to god asking for a fish he might give you a serpent if you don't ask right well, yeah. There you go. Yeah. Now, okay, Ken, can I interrupt you? Yeah, absolutely. Go ahead. Okay. Because um, I want to offer pushback f- that I think Robert Henderson would. Sure, okay? that's right. I think it's right. fair to give him a good Okay, hearing. so I think what he would say is, well, hey, yes, I'm not, I never said to not call God Father, mm-hmm. but I am looking at the totality of what prayer is, and when we don't have answers to prayer, um, we should consider that God is judged because Jesus uses a parable. Uh, it teaches how to pray by using a parable where God is portrayed uh, as a judge. And the parable, of course, actually is the parable of the unjust judge. Right. And uh, and so the parable goes like this, and the, the widow's, it's Luke 18, the yep. widow's trying to yep. get what she wants, get what she wants, and the unjust judge won't give her what she wants, but finally she wears him out with, his, with her pleading. And then the, the kind of conclusion of it is, uh, if this is the way the unjust judge reacts, how much more? I think he does say your heavenly father. Yeah, that's <laughs> Will your right. heavenly father. But then he says, will your heavenly father give you give justice to his elect who cry out to him day and night? So if I'm Robert Henderson, I'm saying, well, hey, 
yes, he's our father, but he is also our judge. Why can't we approach with this legal perspective based on this parable? Well, so you actually, <laughs> speaking of Moses serving into Pharaoh's court, you hit the ball right to me, because my next passage I was going to talk about was the Luke 18 passage. Okay, good. And I've actually sat in uh, events where Robert Henderson was speaking uh -huh. and heard him talk about this. And I've also listened to teaching by Ian Clayton on the same material. So uh -huh. we can debate who came up with it first, but there's a lot of congruence here between the teachings of the two of them. Yeah. And uh, in Luke 18, as you properly point out, Jesus is giving a parable. He's not saying God is the judge in the sense of a courtroom. He simply is saying, and we could, we could read it, he told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. So the preamble to the parable says, Jesus is telling them, pray hard and don't give up praying. You'll get what you need because you pray with consistency and persistence, right? And because you demand your legal rights. Well, actually, it doesn't say anything about <laughs> legal rights. And I think that's, that's really a critical point. So pray with insistency. He says, in a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected men. And there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him and saying, give me justice against my adversary. And for a while he refused. But afterward he said to himself, I love this line, though I neither fear God nor respect man. I mean, who would say that? Anyway, <laughs> yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice so that she will not beat me down by her continual coming. So this, this is a parable. It's an illustration. And Jesus is saying, we've got an unjust judge who can get, if you will, worn down. Mm -hmm. And he, he makes no mention of protocols. He makes no mention of knowing the seven secrets of you know, how you ascend or pray in this way or invoke this particular statute. Right. He simply says, because she's persistent, the judge ultimately relents. And then he goes, but your father is actually more just than this judge. He's kinder than this judge. He wants to answer your prayer. And so he says in the end, will he delay long over those who pray? And so I tell you, he will give justice speedily. And yet, nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? In other words, when the Son of Man comes, will people be praying like this? Not really, no, because they will have tried to, either, they'll either become weary or they will have tried to turn everything into a formula. Uh huh. So, okay. Now, Josh, uh, maybe you could speak into this because I, I know that, that you have a, just a, a passion for, you, you've done a lot of teaching on the, Gnostic, uh, on the Gnostic sort of theology and approach. And I, I know a big part of it is there's sort of loose and creative ways of, of interpreting the scripture and, and maybe even literalizing certain parables. So, uh, you know, in this case, like, so yes, God is a judge, but does that mean that I, I literally need to, you know, the scripture also describes him as being like a farmer, as also being like a fisherman. You know, when I go to prayer, do I need to like, you know clean the fish in prayer. Yeah, I mean, like, how far do we take this? So, yeah. Josh, could you speak into just from what you understand of Gnosticism, what you're seeing here in a literalizing of the parables? Yeah, so, so Gnosticism, and it's, and it's like most... If I, if I was going to say there's, you know, pillars to Islam or uh, the, the core doctrines of the Christian faith, and I was going to say that there are these... Using these as illustrations of of if you move one of these pillars of Islam, you don't have Islam. If you remove the resurrection of Christ Jesus, you don't have Christianity, right? It's something else. There are, I would say, pillars to Gnosticism, and most of them aren't actually in this teaching, right? So, like, the, the pillars of Gnosticism is, like, this, this sentient, unnameable, unknown God, and from him all these eons came into being, and then uh, demigurgas, and there's ridiculous, and the God of the Old Testament is this evil, wicked, bad guy who, who lost his divinity, and then, like, you know, tricked his creation by recreating them into flesh. I mean, there's some really weird stuff uh, in, in the kind of consistent teachings of Gnosticism. You can find those in, like, the Nag Hammadi text, and, and the best place that we have for this is as a an ancient church father by the name of Irenaeus who wrote a book called On the Heresies. It's Irenaeus on the Heresies, where he talks about these things. And to your point, Michael, he basically makes um, narrative text parables and takes parables as narrative texts, right? So the way that we approach a text, oh, this is an illustration. Let's make it hyper literal, okay? Uh, uh, the, the 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 trees of heaven. Now, the kingdom of God is like a tree, uh, and its, it's uh, branches go out and birds come and flock in it, right? Well, what are birds? We see in another passage that birds are demons. So what this is saying is the church grows, demons are going to fill up, and 
Like, it's just ridiculousness, right? It takes narrative text about the woman who had the okay. issue of blood for 12 so I'm years gonna, and all this sort of stuff. So yeah. I'm going to interrupt you for a second because I think this brings us to another point. You, we were going to touch on... Uh, we touched on secret prayer practices and secret knowledge. So secret judgments. Um, Ooh, can I? One, can I? Can I do? Can I do one more thing on the secret prayer before we move yeah, off of it? Yeah, Dude, yeah. I, I want to make sure that our audience knows we're not just talking about like, hey, prayer a specific way. These are some things I've written down. There's secret courts, so you have to go to a specific court that's that's for your specific issue. So if if you uh, have a prayer for your family and friends, that goes to the throne of grace. But maybe you have like a governmental prayer, a prayer for the nation. You have to go to a different court, but you might not have authority. How do you get authority? Well, you've got to be a part of a church. Why is that, how does that church have authority? That church has to be submitted to an apostolic power. Someone who has to be an apostle who has authority in that courtroom has delegated author, uh, authority to you. It's the only way that you can have it. But what if it's for another nation? Well, that apostle has to go to another apostle and submit to their authority. They have to give you access in that courtroom. Also, there are secret books in heaven. That's what the whole courtroom is presiding over. So when uh, the, the courtroom gets together, the whole point of these courts is that um, these angelic beings and God in eternity the past, they predestined everything for your life. Okay, They wrote it into these books, and they put every specific detail of the perfect will of God Go watch last week's episode, The Perfect Will of God for Your Life. And Robert Henderson says, and I quote to the best of my ability, I'm off memory, it's in the study guide. He says, you will not be judged more or less off of what is written in Scripture. You will be judged based off of what is written in these books about you in an eternity past. So there's this secret book in heaven, and you've got to know what's written about you in that book so that you can defend yourself against the accuser of the brethren. Also, there are secret voices. There are nine secret voices, and oddly enough, one of them is finances. So the blood of Jesus is, is voice number one, and, 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 and finance is voice number nine. So, so the blood of Jesus cries out, the blood of martyrs cries out, the voice of all of these angels, these different levels of these secret voices that we've never heard of are crying out in but, heaven. We have to come have in alignment to... with those things. And you, you have to, by revelation, discover what these voices are saying. So, right. Um, and Ken, maybe you can, you can comment on this. D is this bordering on necromancy? The idea that I have to, by revelation, know what... And Josh, you can help me out here if I'm misinterpreting mm -hmm. what he was saying about the voices. But he has a whole chapter on understanding the cloud of witnesses. And he says, we must come into agreement with what the cloud of witnesses are saying so that we can apply what's said in heaven as our legal right expressed on the earth. Josh, did I portray that accurately? No, yeah, absolutely. Okay, Ken, is, is this necromancy or is this... I probably wouldn't call it necromancy okay. myself. Necromancy, in my mind, is when people seek to commune with, to communicate with, uh, dead people for purposes of gaining um, preternatural knowledge, unnatural okay. knowledge. I think Robert Henderson is attempting to recognize this idea that those who have gone before us in Christ are still alive as the cloud of witnesses. And Amen to that, yeah. Hebrews 12. So I think he's attempt. Uh, he may not be saying it very well, but I, I don't think he's moving us towards necromancy as that term is properly understood. Okay. Uh, here's he here's a quote a, from the. Uh, go, ahead, go ahead, Josh. Josh. I was just going to say that he makes a point in the book to say that um, these these voices um, will come to you. It's not necessarily something that you need to seek out. He actually makes the distinction about how that could in fact be witchcraft. So, like, I, in in making sure that we are trying to um, rightly articulate the danger of this book, I don't want to overemphasize something unfairly. Um, right. I might I might agree. I, I'm the guy who's like talking to my high church brother and who are like praying to the saints. And I'm like, that's necromancy. And I'm giving this guy, I'm giving this guy grace and mercy. So, 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 so y'all, y'all know that I'm just like, I love my high church brothers. My Anglican friends are watching my, my, uh, my, uh, Eastern Orthodox friends are watching. I, I love you guys. You, you know that I'm just, uh, I'm passionate about this specific subject. Um, yeah. yeah, so so all of I wanted to make sure that our audience knew before we yeah, got off of and prayer. And to be clear, not I'm not accusing, I'm asking. Right, I think right. it's a fair right. question. Oh, yeah, yeah. Here's the sure. um, here's a quote from the book, okay? Um, <clears throat> Robert Henderson, there is a very real cloud of witnesses in heaven. They are part of the court system of heaven. 
They have a strategic function as witnesses in this judicial process of getting our prayers answered. They cannot be made perfect without us. May we learn to flow in agreement with them, the dead people in heaven. May we learn to flow in agreement with them for God's purposes to manifest on earth. So by revelation, find out what they're saying, agree with it, yeah, and I read that book, but that still sounds like necromancy. <laughs> 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 I, I still uh, wouldn't. I still wouldn't go all the way to calling it necromancy personally, because I've dealt with spirits of necromancy when I've done deliverance ministry on people, and I know what they sound like and look like, and know what they do. Yeah, that's a different conversation. That's a good time for a story. Well, no, I, because it will <laughs> take us way down a rabbit hole. It trip. will. It will. But 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 I'll just say, so I I agree with this first premise that. Yeah, there is a cloud of witnesses, and it is Amen. in heaven, and they are at the moment without resurrection bodies, or they're disembodied. But the rest of what he said, I, I'm not sure that you can actually base any of that in Scripture. Yeah. And, and and that's really where I want to kind of go with this, is that you know one of the fundamental principles of biblical interpretation is to look at what the Scripture says in its most clear and plain meaning first, and then secondly... Uh, beyond that, to stay with the main and the plain understanding of Scripture. And a lot of this stuff that we're talking about is what I would term, at best, speculative theology. It's not mm -hmm. clearly rooted and anchored in the unambiguous meaning of the text. It's speculative. It's it's not clear that you know we have to be in alignment with the saints who are in heaven so that they can get what they are waiting for and we can get what we're waiting for. I I do understand the language about you know we all get perfected together. That that's in scripture. That was, but yeah. but th this idea that they're waiting on us and we're waiting on them in the way that he's described it. I'm not so sure about that. And I, I want to go back to one other thing that it's not exactly the same thing as what I just addressed, but we moved on and we didn't cover this 10 minutes ago, so I, want to, I just want to speak to it right now. Um, when we were looking at these two passages in Luke where the Lord's Prayer is, Luke 11, and then again with the story of the persistent widow in Luke 18, those are found respectively in chapters 11 and 18. Uh-huh. Now, I hope everybody who's watching this broadcast or listening to it understands that 18 follows 11, and 11 follows some other numbers, one of which is 10. So what happens in Luke chapter 10? I'm learning a lot today. I know, it's amazing, isn't it? <laughs> but you see, this is right in numerology. This is, no, no, this is... Yeah. <laughs> numerology. That's it. I'm, 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 that's it. I'm becoming a numerologist now. I'm going to put a pyramid on my head, too. Um, <laughs> Here we go. But the reason I say that, even though it's so obvious as to be painful, is that this is the plain and obvious truth, that 10 precedes 11 precedes 18. Uh -huh. What happens in Luke chapter 10? It's a really important verse. In Luke chapter 10, in verse 17, Jesus has sent out the 72 disciples. Uh -huh. And actually, in Luke 9, he sent out the 12 apostles. Mm -hmm. So we could even put a little more runway in front of it. So in Luke 9, he sends out 12, and they have great success in the ministry they're conducting of healing and deliverance. And you notice that there's no language of the courts of heaven of how they're to do this. Instead, the 12 are sent to preach the kingdom of God, to heal and to deliver. And that's what they do. And then it says, after this, Luke 10, the Lord sent out 72 others. He gave them the same commission, proclaim the kingdom of God, heal and deliver. That's what they were sent to do. Well, by the time we get to Luke 10, 17, the 72 have returned from that initial foray, that initial mission they were sent on. And when they come back, they say, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. This is amazing. And Jesus says, don't rejoice that the demons are subject to you. Rejoice rather that your names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life, that your names are written in heaven. So what you are doing is because you have eternal destiny in me, not because you followed some formula or ritual. Not only that, Luke 10, 17, while you were doing what you were doing, what were they doing? Preaching the kingdom, healing, and, and casting, driving out demons. And casting principalities out of the atmosphere? No, that's not what it said. They were driving <laughs> demons out of people. That's right. While you were doing that, Jesus says, I was watching, now probably in a prophetic vision, 
I was watching Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Crash. So what was it that cast Satan out of heaven? In the earliest verses that we looked at together out of Job and out of 1 Kings chapter 22, we saw Satan actually still had access to the heavenly courtroom. And by courtroom, I don't mean the one where the judge sits. I mean the one where the king sits. All right. When we look at Luke, Luke chapter 10, what's happened is uh, the disciples have returned, and as they have returned, Satan no longer has any place in heaven. And in fact, we see this kind of language in the book of Revelation. We spent a lot Revelation of time talking 12. about Revelation today. But it right says, now. Satan was cast out of heaven, and he's come down to the earth, and he's filled with wrath because his time is short. I think this, this story of Jesus seeing Satan falling like lightning from heaven is related to all of that. In other words, even if there were a courtroom of a judicial sense, Satan has been thrown out of the courtroom. We could say he's yeah, been removed yes. for contempt well, of court. Exactly. But in, in context, like if we want to address principalities and powers, as we should, Ephesians 6, 10 and following, our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, spirit, you know, uh, spirits that work in this dark world. If we want to address these things, we do it in the way the Bible prescribes. Right. We don't invent new ways of doing it right. that are secret and esoteric and very hard to figure out and super convoluted. So in the context that you just describe, how is Satan displaced from, call it a geographical region, if we want to look at it like that, or from, uh, I mean... I love it that you're asking this question. I love it. Thank you. Yeah. You, you, you know, hit the ball into well, my court because, again. You see, the way I, I've always understood that passage yeah. that you just described in Luke ten seventeen. We have to understand in context that this is a direct result of their preaching of the gospel. That's exactly. Yeah, and they, so there is an entire section the the of land. there's an entire sort of charismatic practice that is there. You know what? There is a principality of lust over this city. There is a principality of greed over this city, and so they gather together and they have prayer meetings to cast down principalities and powers, and and. Uh, and Robert Henderson would say that you need to find the legal right and why that principality is there and repent on behalf of a bunch of people you've never met. And then part of this process, you know, the, the principality, if you discover the book and if you agree with the voices, the nine voices, then you might be able to cast that principality. And I say, that's not what the Bible says to do. The that's Bible correct. says preach the gospel. And where he really hinges his argument is on Daniel 10, which I quoted earlier, where, uh, where, Gabriel is resisted by the, these principalities over Persia and Greece, but that verse never says that Daniel got his answer to prayer because he sought a legal right. That's correct. Daniel got his answer to prayer because he persevered in prayer and fasting, That's which, correct. lo and behold, is what the Bible tells us to do to get our answers to prayer. And what Robert Henry said... Luke 11 and Luke yes, 18. Yes, and what, so what Jesus says to do is persevere in calling out to me and praying and fasting and having faith. But what Robert Henderson says to do is discover the legal court system, ascend through different jurisdictions, jump through these legal loops and, and processes and procedures, file your heavenly paperwork, listen to the nine voices, including dead grandma, and then <laughs> you might get your, get your breakthrough. And if you're not getting your breakthrough, this is probably why it comes back to the legal right. Okay, so let's go back. I got to a little passionate there. That's all right. Sorry, I know we were trying to keep the tone let's nice. Keep tell, us, out of tell us what you really think, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I've taught on this before, um, but I, I'll keep this brief. In the Olivet Discourse, which is Jesus sitting on the Mount of Olives, and it's, it's just before his death, he's giving sort of last-minute instructions to his disciples, and he's talking about the end of the, of the age. And he says in Matthew 24, 14, and this gospel of the kingdom, so there we are back to preaching the kingdom of heaven, uh -huh. which that could be its own podcast, actually, because the kingdom message has been so twisted and diluted and, I don't know, over time that I'm not sure most people really understand what that is. But uh -huh. anyway, we'll just take it as a set piece right now. This gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all the nations, and then the end will come. So there's a, there's a requisite condition 
that the end comes after the gospel of the kingdom is proclaimed to all the nations. This isn't just the whatever it is, 195 nations that are in the United Nations today. These are all the ethno-linguistic groups of the earth, and at the last count I saw, there are 6,207 of those. So this gospel gets preached to all people groups would be a way of saying it. But then, I'm skipping forward, but I'm not really leaving much uh, on the table by doing that. I'm just trying to keep this succinct. It says, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from heaven. <clears throat> now watch this. And the powers of the heavens will be shaken. These are the principalities and powers that we read about elsewhere in the scripture, including in the passage you cited out of Ephesians 6. Mm. So, after the darkening of the sun and these other celestial signs, the powers, these high-level spirits, they will be shaken. How does that happen? Well, that happens through a verb in Greek that is called saluo. And in English transcription, that would be S like Sam, A-L-E-U-O, saluo. And if you think of a pyramid in which you've got highest ranking demons up here with a number, a higher number of lower ranking demons here, and an even higher number of yet lower ranking demons here, and an even greater number of lower ones here. Screw tape. Well, these are, these are called by Paul the authorities, the rulers, the uh, dominions, and the thrones. Mm -hmm. Dominions and thrones are the principalities, and these down here, the rulers and authorities, are the powers principalities mm -hmm. and powers. But we see this pyramid, and what this is talking about is these up on top, these principalities, which are thrones and dominions, they are shaken. And how does it happen? Because the gospel of the kingdom is being preached. We're taking out bricks down here at the authority and the ruler level, and pretty soon the thing becomes unstable like a house of cards, and all of a sudden <coughs> some dominions drop, which causes the thrones to drop, and pretty soon the whole thing cascades huh. down. So Jesus is saying the way this is going to happen, with the way we saluo, the way we kick over, is a pretty good English colloquial translation, the way we kick over the demonic pyramid is actually by confronting the demons that we face right here now in this way through preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Amen. It's a much Amen. more practical and tangible way than dealing with something esoteric and, um, you know, I, the best construction I can put on all of this courts of heaven teaching is what Paul also in Ephesians refers to, Ephesians 4.14. He says, then we will become like a mature man and we will not be blown about by every wind of doctrine. At the best construction of this I can put on it is it's a wind of doctrine. Uh -huh. It may be worse than that. I mean, Josh is calling yeah, it heresy, I, but, but it's well, not better than a wind I, of doctrine. I want to ask, and, and Josh, let me volley this over to you. This is a double question. What yeah. is our most charitable view of Robert H Henderson's teaching on the courts of yeah. heaven? And then what is the worst view? Like, give us the spectrum. Where are we at? Is this definitely yeah. heresy? Is it definitely not heresy and just a little wonky? I mean, what's the most charitable and what's the least charitable view? Yeah, so... so and leave you know, Grandma out of it. <laughs> yeah, I agree. That's good. Good point. We have gradations of 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 doctrine, right? You, you have your good doctrine, your orthodox doctrine. You've got stuff we disagree with, right? Uh, if 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 I if uh, if Dawson is out there and he's he's watching, I know he's watching. He's like, hey, I'm reformed. I'm like, I'm not reformed. I disagree with that, right? That's a disagreement on Christian brothers on a doctrine we can disagree on, right? Then then we have things that are just like like bad, right? Like I would. Try, try not to think of a doctrine that would be a bad doctrine. Um, you know, like um, Jesus stopped we, being God when he came to earth or something. I, I classify that one bad. I would say that one is indulgences. Oh, oh, so you're, oh, so you're saying bad, but not heretical. Yes. Okay. Indulgences okay. Never bad. mind. <laughs> damn anyone, that's not going to damn anyone's soul, right? That's bad. That's bad doctrine. And then you have, you have your dangerous doctrine and then you have your heretical doctrine. I would say okay. heresy is like, First, second, third century, Apostles' Creed, Nicene Creed, Chalcedonian Creed, like the early church helped us define what heresy was. And it typically has to do with the nature and character of God, right? Now, there are uh, horribly dangerous doctrines, right? Uh, and, and I would say in this list, you know, we, we talked about uh, kind of the secret practices of prayer. We even touched on um, like judgment, like to say, if I'm going to be judged by the secret book that's in heaven and not what's written in scripture, Consider all the people who are getting divorced 
and saying, well, I know the scriptures tell me this, but I checked in the courts of heaven and I actually got permission uh, because the guy I was married to before wasn't my best life now. And the courts of heaven tell me I can upgrade, you know, uh, that's horrible. Yeah. And, and to be clear, Josh, you're, you're just saying what the book says, right? Like he literally huh. says outright, well, this is what it says. We will not be judged so much by what sins we committed, but by how much our life measured up to what was written in our books, which we discover by secret revelation. And, and if we're gonna, if we're gonna, that would be that would be one that would say, I mean, look look how how borderline, crazy, damaging, outside the Christian faith that is. That's that's beyond the Christian faith. You're saying that the standards that were set up by Christ for all people everywhere for all time, the infallibility of Scripture um, is not, in fact, going to be universal. Uh, it's very subjective um, because it might not apply to you in certain areas, and it, and it may apply to you in others. Um, there, there's a couple of other areas that I think are, are very, very confusing. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give Robert Henderson the benefit of the doubt and say he's using sloppy language, right? Mm-hmm. Um, we're not known for using very tight language in the Pentecostal charismatic movement. I'm, I'm calling you brothers back in. Please help me. Help me fight this fight of, of, of going after the gifts of the Spirit, going after a move of God, but using historic theological language. It's a fight worth having. Um, but, but he talks about the pre-incarnation of the soul. Now, this is a staple of Gnosticism. Uh, he makes the case that because we were predestined by the courts of heaven, the courts of heaven predestined us into these books, that we were logos, we were written word, right? And he says that Jesus was the logos, and he was incarnate. He became flesh in the same way when the courts of heaven wrote our book, we were Logos and were incarnate. And he uses a lot of experience to kind of explain that to us, his personal experience, which happens all yes. over the book. Right. So he, he says people. he believes in a pre-incarnate soul because of an experience that he had. Yeah. And the way, but, but, but let me back up. Did you, if you didn't hear, if you didn't catch it, he says we are pre-incarnate because we were written, we were Logos. And then he says, Jesus was Logos and made flesh. I don't think he means this. I think it's sloppy, but the logical conclusion is that if we um, were written, we were Logos because the divine courts put us into being, then Jesus is not eternally begotten of the Father. He actually came into being when the courts of heaven wrote him into a book. I don't believe Robert Henderson believes that. If you're out there, Robert, I'm not saying that you believe that. That being said, the way the book is written is so uh, careless that you could logically come to that conclusion. Um, there are other things as well that are in here uh, about the courts of heaven when talking about justification. Joshua, the high priest, is up in heaven, and, and, and it, uh, uh, the, the, the accuser of the brethren is accusing him. And after the accuser gets uh, rebuked, these angels clothe him with robes of righteousness, and the prophet speaks to a righteous turban on his head. So Robert Henderson tells us that, that if we are to finally find these secret books, we're finally able to use the right language, we go to the right court, we make sure we have authority, and we're actually able to, to rebuke the devil because of the secret things that we know about this book, then we have to have angels and prophets speak prophetic words over us so that we can be really clothed in righteousness so Satan can't come back and attack us later. So Josh, let's just be really clear here, because you've made a super important point that we need to be careful about our language. I don't want to make it like so tight that everyone's afraid to say anything out of fear that they're going to say it wrong. But right. but it, it is a really important point that we do need to define our terms. That's why I started out with three kinds of courts, and I, I, I very much agree with you on this. Um, but you're saying <clears throat> that, if I heard you, because you said it twice, you're saying that Robert Henderson believes that the courts of heaven preordained our days rather than God himself, because Psalm 139 says God wrote all of our days in his book, not the courts. Right. Well, so Robert would would then go say, um, when God in Genesis 1 said, let us make man in our own image, he would say that was a divine courtroom scene. So in the same way that God, certainly God did write all these things in the book, and it's that text that he uses to say that we each have our own individual book. 
um, uh, the one that you quoted there in the psalm. So, so he's actually putting these two things together and saying that they're collectively working together to write these books. Now, I think, again, if you were to press Robert Henderson, he doesn't say this explicitly in the book, but it's, it is implied if you're careful. If you push him on this and say, hey, do you think that the courts of heaven wrote the story in life of Jesus, that he was, he was uh, in kind of an Aryan way, uh, uh, he, he came into being at some point in time, uh, he would say, no, I, I believe that Jesus was eternally begotten of the Father, has always been in eternity past, has never not been, was the, was the Logos, the eternal word. Um, I think that if you pushed him on it, he would say that. But because of sloppy language, it does imply that the courts of heaven, um, in fact, write our book, our, our future, our perfect life, and the life of Jesus. So I think, I think the takeaway from this that you're saying, and I would add kind of what we've been saying here in the studio, is that language matters. Words actually do matter. And part of what we have to do is be careful enough with our language that we don't inadvertently say things that is that inadvertently say things that are either uh, wrong, factually wrong, theologically in error, or potentially misleading. Right. That's part of doing good theology. Right. And Josh, what I hear you saying is you view the book as dangerous, bordering on heresy in some parts, but you're maybe not not ready to go full out and pull the heresy card? Uh, well, what I'll say is that um, Valentinus, when he's writing these Gnostic books, he knows what he's doing and he's trying to, right? Um, uh, Robert Henderson, I think, is ignorant. Like, I, I know that's really rude, and it's not, it's not, it doesn't sound like gentle-spirited, and it's very not the normal ethos of Remnant Radio, but I'm just really, like, prayer is supposed to be a liberating thing that yes. we can roll our burdens onto our Father, who mm, loves man. his kids. Mm, and yes. we have turned, through this book, prayer into something that's fearful. If you don't do it perfectly right, demons are going to come after you and your family, after your nation, even worse afflictions coming after you. It opens the door for something that's supposed to liberate and empower the Christian life into some kind of monotonous, laborious, heavy yoke that no one, no one can navigate this level of secret knowledge. Uh, if, they, if they bought every single one of Robert Henderson's books, uh, you, you still could not. Uh, I, I mean, I read the last yeah. chapter, and it doesn't tell me how to hold the courtroom. It doesn't tell me how to get these rooms together and how to hear these voices and, and how to, to silence the voice of the accuser. He doesn't give me any language. He just tells me these are all the things you need. Good luck. Goodbye. Yeah. Uh, one, of, <laughs> one of our uh, one of our viewers, it, it was a comment some time ago, but in the comment section, he said something to the effect of, "Why would we want to turn prayer to our heavenly Father into going to the Inclusive. DMV?" <laughs> yeah, yeah, I read that one. I thought it was hilarious. Oh yeah, man, uh, uh, Stephen D. Young. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, uh, Ken, I want to ask you because I know you've cast a lot of demons out. I've seen you do it, and I know that this legal right language is not necessarily 100% without merit, that there's, um, when we're talking about spiritual warfare, although we might not use that language, we might use the language, I think maybe I've heard you say, like an open door to the demonic. Um, I'm, okay, so I'm going to try to be charitable here for a moment, okay? So, for once. <laughs> for <laughs> once in my life. Okay, so... Uh, so I know that you believe in the that there's such a thing as an open door. Like when you look at First Samuel chapter sixteen and and eighteen, and you see the evil spirit that comes on Saul. You see in chapter eighteen, it's immediately after he puts a jealous eye on David. The next day, a harmful spirit comes upon him. That's right. Uh, or Ephesians four twenty six and twenty seven. Don't let the sun go down on your anger, and do not give the devil a foothold. Okay, so if we just modify the language slightly, and we call it an open door, or maybe what I use, the language I tend to use with my church when talking about the demonic is I'll, I'll talk about it as a hole in our armor, because I try to be very... Oh, I, a reference, an allusion to uh, Ephesians chapter 6 with right. the armor of God. And the reason I talk about it that way is I've seen so much craziness with demons, like as in the way people talk about it, whereas I, what I see in Scripture is so simple... And what I see when people talk about casting out demons, I see it so, and I know we're, I don't want to just camp out too much on ca casting out demons, but 
Anyway, we, we've made it so complicated. So I try to use a simple language. But I know you believe that open doors are a thing. Yep. I know you believe that holes in your armor are a thing. And if we want to be charitable, Robert Henderson is just using a different language. He's calling it legal rights. And, hey, if a, if a demon can oppress a person, then certainly he could cause a prayer not to, uh, not to be answered. And, and so there's, uh, is there any validity to this approach at all? And if so, how would you modify it to make it more agreeable with the Scripture? Wow, that's a big question. Um, well, Robert Henderson addresses this subject both at the personal level and, I would say, at the national level in some of his other books, mm -hmm. and Ian Clayton as well. I don't want to leave Ian Clayton out of this conversation because he is a, he is a significant actor, and he has had dramatic influence in other nations, not so much in the U.S., partial parts and of the he, U.S. But he's a former warlock, correct? He, he is reported to be a former warlock by his own hand. Yes. So this isn't, this isn't hearsay. And okay. in, in my opinion, um, probably he just never got free of all the spirits that gave him his warlock powers. But anyway, um, so when we talk about these legal rights of access, I like your language of hole in the armor, uh, sometimes I'll say something like, uh, you know, if you, if you are living in a particular area of sin, that can become a point of attachment. Mm -hmm. So in, in the case of Saul, whom you mentioned, he had disobeyed God and on a very specific direct instruction he had been given, and that seems to have been the opening move of a wider series of problems that arose in Saul's life. Mm -hmm. So for people who have open doors in their lives where they're having struggles and difficulties, a lot of times we do need to uh, sit down and talk with them through those things that they have done. And it's important, I think, that this be done um, with someone else for this reason. There are a lot of people who say, do this yourself, but many times we don't know the evil that's in our own heart. Jeremiah mm -hmm. says the heart is desperately wicked and beyond repair, and, and who can even know their own heart? Mm. And so there are times when people have done things that are wrong, and they didn't even know they were wrong. Mm -hmm. They just didn't know they were wrong. They, they, they didn't have enough knowledge of the Scripture, and they went ahead and did it. It doesn't, for that reason, make it right, nor does it mean that you're exempt from whatever penalty comes from that. Mm -hmm. You right. just did something wrong. And so part of what we do is we try to line everything up according to Scripture, and when we become aware that there are problems, then we confess them, and we apply the blood of Jesus to those specific transgressions and sins so mm -hmm. they can be forgiven. But that's not the same as going into a courtroom. Mm. Okay, that's good. Okay, um, so what I want to do is, because we're actually a couple minutes over time right now. It's okay, we started half an hour late. <laughs> <laughs> or a few minutes late, actually. But um, anyway, what I want to do is, uh, just to kind of summarize just what we're, uh, what we're saying here, and then uh, Ken and Josh, I want to give you guys a chance to, uh, to share some closing thoughts. And, uh, and I'll just, to summarize what we've talked about, we've talked about there's a lot of secrecy involved in this teaching. And, and we're, we're seeing some connections to the Gnostic understanding of secret knowledge that sort of makes me special, sort of makes me spiritual. And, and there's even that sort of ranking system he talks through. And you can, uh, just like in the courtroom, you can you know, argue in a Supreme Court if you have a certain jurisdiction in a, or if you have a certain level uh, and, and so on. And so we can ascend to different levels with the secret knowledge. And so we talked about secret judgments secret books, secret deliverance, secret witnesses, secret jurisdictions, and secret prayer pra practices, and then sort of secret scriptural interpretations and understandings of a pre-incarnate soul based on John 1, and sort of a creative sort of uh, flying loose with the scriptures. And so th there's a little bit of a summary of just kind of what we talked about. And so all of us are in agreement that, uh, that we are concerned about this teaching. And if you are, uh, if you have ascribed to it in some manner, we would certainly encourage you to stop that, uh, to tell the Lord you're sorry you didn't know what you were doing. Uh, and, and I would, I would really say that. Sorry, I'm, not, I'm I didn't know what I was doing. I would stop it immediately because it it turns God and His revelation to us 
as father into uh, it, approaching him to this sort of convoluted system, uh, and, and we believe that it's it at least borders on Gnosticism, mm -hmm. and, and we think that's dangerous. It was condemned as a heresy uh, in the early church, and um, if it's not Gnostic, it has it's at least Gnostic light, and yeah. so we're concerned about it. Uh, Josh, why don't you share a few closing thoughts? Yeah, um, I really, really want you all to go pick up the study guide in the show description. Uh, it's super enlightening. We've got quotes in there. Um, this is just the very first paragraph. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read to you real quick, talking about Gnosticism, just picking back on what Michael said. Gnosticism is a religious movement uh, popular in the second and third century of the Christian church. Gnosticism's influence can be uh, seen in various Christian heresies and in Christian uh, 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 poems against the uh, movement, uh, move, movement's tendencies, Gnosticism believed uh, in the possibility of higher level of spiritual knowledge or gnosis, and uh, recommended various means of achieving a higher spiritual state. So, so it, it keeps going on in that definition, but, but ultimately the idea of Gnosticism is that the, the supernatural is more important than the natural. And because of that, this natural world is clouding our faculties. We're not able un to understand spiritual truth. So we need to get to the heavens to understand these truths, to release them here on the earth. And there's a lot of language like that. I would really encourage Pentecostal charismatic friends. We are a part of you. You are a part of us. We have so much in common. We're contending for the same thing. I, I would ask go and read some stuff on Gnosticism and help put some bumpers on our theology because so much of our movements are so consumed with this super new, what's the new revelation? What's the new teaching? What's this new thing that'll get you breakthrough? I'm telling you, if, if it's new, you don't want it. If it's, yes. been, if it's, if it's 15, 16, 1800 years old, 2000 years old, you need to be using it, okay? Uh, you, you don't need anything you new. You need something old. It's like a steak or a wine. Don't get the grape juice. Get the good stuff, okay? Um, and that's, that's that. Back off the kin. <laughs> yeah. I'm still stuck on steak or wine, and I'm thinking aged beef and uh, there you, you know, that's a 10-year-old bottle of Cabernet or something. Yeah. Right? You caught it. You caught it. That's right, yeah. <laughs> Well, there's so many things I, you know, I, I'd like to say. Sometimes wisdom says that maybe you shouldn't say all that's on your mind. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so Ken's, so Ken's final word is is just I pass. Nah. No, it's not that. <laughs> but final word, but, nah. but I, I will say uh, I agree with what's been said by the two of you. I would really urge people to stay away from this. Um, yeah. I don't think it's. I don't think it's constructive, and I've had a lot of conferences where I've been speaking where people show up, and in one way or another, they all say more or less the same thing. They all say it in their own way, of course. But they'll say, you know, so-and-so told me to come talk to you because you'd be able to give me a straight answer about the courts of heaven. And I say, well, what have you been doing? Well, you know, I got these books, and I tried it. And I say, well, did it work? Well, No. And, you know, I think at the end of the day, we want stuff that works. I mean, I think good theology is practical and pragmatic both. And so that's your first indicator that something's really not quite right here. Of course, in defense of people who teach us, they'd probably say, well, you didn't follow the nine steps or the, you know, you 11 didn't. secrets or, you know, whatever. But You didn't hear grandma. You didn't hear <laughs> grandma. <laughs> but but I, I've seen a distressingly high percentage of failure from people who are trying this and again, I'm trying to put the best construction on it. At the lower end of the scale, where possibly we're, we're on the border with Gnosticism, or maybe even inadvertently crossed the boundary and got into it, I've actually seen people who have needed to get delivered of evil spirits, literal demons, um, because they were trafficking in false doctrine, false teaching on some level. And I wouldn't want to see that happen to people. So I would really urge you to stay away from this. Amen. Okay, cool. So there you go. It's a little bit of a different episode for us, but uh, but we felt like it was important. And there's another episode coming up on Wednesday, 4 p.m. Central Time. Uh, this uh, tonight was more on sort of like the, the Gnostic 
tendencies of the Courts of Heaven approach. But on Wednesday at 4 p.m., we're going to focus on some of the exegetical fallacies uh, that that Robert Henderson uh, shares in his book. We think this the, this really comes back to just an understanding of how do we interpret the Scripture. And so, because uh, if we have the proper hermeneutic, the proper means of interpreting the Scripture, a method, uh, then it's going to save us from these kinds of traps. And so, uh, it's going to be a really important, good episode. I encourage you guys to, uh, to join us. So, like, comment, subscribe, donate, and have a great sleep tonight. God bless you guys, and have a great week.